Welcome to Generations, a show which helps people 50 and better lead happy, healthy, and productive lives. Our moderator today is Nadia Giordana, and here's Nadia. Welcome to the show. I'm Nadia Giordana. Co-hosting with me today is Diane Winkler. Thank you very much. I'm excited about today. It's good to have you here. And Ed Noreen. Hi there. Love ya. <laughs> and our guest is Karen Lund. Karen is going to be talking with us about being an elder, becoming a treasure. And Karen, why don't we start off? I heard you say at one time that being an elder, becoming an elder is not so much about aging. What did you mean by that? When I defined it and decided to define it my way, I wanted to make sure that it was not an age-related issue. Mm -hmm. So I say a, a, an elder is one who has wisdom and experience and lives their life with humility and gratitude. And you can be an elder at any age mm -hmm. if you want to use your wisdom and, those, and that experience. So it will vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense. I, I like that analogy. Mm -hmm. I suppose you can't really be a teenager and be an elder, but you probably could be a wise member of, member of the family even at that age. So you could even perhaps be in your 40s or 50s. You don't have to be 70s, 80s, or 90s to be an elder in the family. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying, right. Okay. I just felt that all people and all of us have something to offer. And so why say that an elder has an age? Mm -hmm. it, a person who has something to offer, no matter what the age, is important to our society. Have you ever had an experience yourself in regard to what you just said about how old you are and what we can do and did it ever happen to you? I think so. I mm -hmm. think um, one of the things as I look back on my life and look at the different, as I look at my life, I can see myself really developing skills throughout. Okay. And based on that, when I started consulting, uh, and I was in my late 30s, and they were giving me activities to do, I said, but I already know how to do this. Oh, that was <laughs> because good. actually I was trained as a teacher, and the skills mm -hmm. of teaching are the same as skills of being a cons business consultant. So I oh think gosh. for me, that's what happened. Oh my goodness, thank you. I fully understand that position, because I was in the school system for so many, many years. Okay. And uh, I wish more people could hear that explanation <laughs> because it makes sense. There would be people, younger people, mm -hmm. that you go to because you know they have a feel for yes. something in yes. particular. Yes. They don't know everything about life, but they have something in particular. I think the other thing that got me to thinking about the elders was the fact that I have worked with Indian tribes. And oh. every mm -hmm. time I worked, with the tribe, one of the most important things was that I worked with the elders. Nothing was changed, and when you're a consultant, you're changing things, yeah. but I never changed anything or suggested any changes unless I had reviewed it with the elders. And you began to see how important that role is in their culture. Mm -hmm. And I think many of the elders in that culture, and hopefully it's happening in ours, preserve some of the old stories mm -hmm. too. Right. And that's another thing I'm, I'm saying when I um, looked at this, is that we as elders have to take the role of elders. I'm sometimes hearing older people go, oh, well, they don't respect me. Don't worry about it. Get out there and work with the young. Work with all ages. And as you give of yourself, <coughs> you will receive back, and they will respect you. So I'm not a person that gets hung up on, oh, I'm not respected or I can't do this. It's like when I talk about some of and some of my friends who have children and grandchildren, and the grandchildren come over and sit in front of their, their dinner playing on their telephones. I say, <laughs> set a basket out. When you come to visit, the telephones go in the basket. 
you can ask for that as an elder. Mm -hmm. You can decide that that's important for our family, mm -hmm. for us to share. Mm -hmm. And this is the way I look at things. It's a wonderful way to look at things, believe me, because I'm, I understand exactly where you're coming from. When I was uh, on my work at the schools, I was always said my name was Mrs. Winkler. Well, nowadays, I hear so many saying, hello, Joan, hello, and I miss that because I, I didn't request it, but I knew I had it coming. So we did that, and I never had a problem with anybody saying, hey, you. You know, what you've just said is really important because we don't have to be a dictator when we ask people to do things and ask the ch children and grandchildren. But what we do need is to say, this is the way we're going to do it at my house. Mm -hmm. This is the way we're going to carry on as a family. Mm -hmm. One of the things I have put in the book is a value exercise for the family mm -hmm. so that the family can decide what are our values mm -hmm. now and how are we going to live those values. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what do you mean by how we're going to live those values? I think what we're, I'm saying is if we have to decide what the values are first. If, okay. if honesty mm -hmm. is a value for us mm -hmm. as a family, then how do we behave in an honest way? Mm -hmm. Too often what I found is people just say, oh yeah, integrity is really important to me but how are you going to live it? What are you going to do? And that doesn't c come through a lot with people. They don't connect what they value, what they believe, with what their behavior should be. And I'm a behaviorist. <laughs> you know, I have to, I'm pretty honest with that. Well, I think that's great. That's you know, I'd like to add, um, um, our culture has a tendency to be youth oriented. Now, when you go to Asia, and you worked in Asia, Mm -hmm. is there there's a respect with age and the wisdom that comes with experience. I remember I used to live in Chicago and a, a friend of mine who was in middle age, a woman, said she was a crone. And I said, what's that? <laughs> and she, it was, she was celebrating her middle age, you know, she was through bringing children in. And she had become a teacher, a healer, a woman that had experience and wisdom. And it's the celebrating of our state in life. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that people, we are baby boomers, and we are the largest part of the population. Mm -hmm. And it, we have a perspective and a sense of history that the young cannot have. They haven't had enough experience for it. And in, in a many way, we become role models, we become teachers mm -hmm. and guides and set boundaries and standards. I think the other part of that is, and one of my suggestions to the elder, is that we can't compare, well, the kids aren't, they don't play the way we used to play. Mm -hmm. We don't, and every generation is different, and what I suggest as I work with people and get people to understand what I'm trying to get through to them about is you just have to accept that people today, the young, are just wired for technology. Mm -hmm. You cannot take that away. But don't complain about it, accept it, and make them your friend and helper, because they know technology better than any yeah. of us sitting right. here. <laughs> you know, so I, I just, I look at things like that. I t in fact, one of the really is little stories I say in the book is about my mother who grew up on a farm and for her to get to school when she was in elementary school was um, during winter she had to take a horse and sleigh. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was about six, seven, eight, something like that, we could only get so far to the farm, to my uncle's farm, and so he had to come and pick us up in a horse and sleigh. But we didn't use it every day. That was mm -hmm. one time I remember it. And today, when you look at the children, if they live in a winter setting or go to visit, 
they might go to a party and experience a horse and sleigh. So it's this, we could sit here for a long time and come up with all those ideas. We just have to accept generationally, we are different, we mm -hmm. come from different perspectives, but we can learn from each other. We mm -hmm. can share with each other. And that's what I see. Is that one of the ways that you use, you've you talked about being a storyteller. Uh, is that one of the ways you use your storytelling? Yes, that's one of the ways. I tried, I've interviewed a few people for in the book, mm -hmm. but I've also tried to tell stories. Uh, one of my favorite stories, um, I talk about we need to try to get back to our childlike behavior as elders. We've got to have some fun in our life. And I talk about my uncle who was celebrating his 95th birthday. And he decided that he would plan it. And he invited anybody and everybody who wanted to come. Now the other thing he did was he hired two musicians to come and play because he had to have his dollar dance. So the women lined up, and you know at that age there's going to be a lot more women than men. <laughs> and he earned about $85 that day. And we had great fun, and only 350 people attended his birthday party. So that's having fun. And that's part of, you were talking earlier about celebrating. That's what we have to do in our life too, is celebrate. We've all made achievements. I don't care who you are. You've done something with your life, and that's important, and we need to celebrate why we're here, what we do, and how we can continue to have an involvement in our life. Uh -huh. Very good. Very good. Is, is becoming an elder, and, or I should say being an elder, as your, the title of your book says, and becoming a treasure, are there subtle differences between those two things? Here's what I'm saying is, when we, ha we already are being an elder by using our wisdom and experience. But if we understand what other possibilities there are for us, what are our opportunities, and how we can impact many other people, then that's when we become a greater treasure okay. to the population. Oh, I see. Okay, that's, you know, it, and I think the impact you can have on your grandchildren. To me, that, that's so important. And so when we think about that, if you understand that you can inspire children, mm -hmm. you can create magic mm -hmm. for children, you can inspire their minds, you can have great fun with them, you can also live the values that you've decided. When you look at all of that and you do it, then you are a treasure. That is such a great thing. Oh my goodness. I think we're all treasures, don't you? We are. I think so. <laughs> and you know, I feel like as we follow that path within the family, we also enrich our own lives mm -hmm. as we're enriching the lives of the family. Wouldn't you say so? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing, if, if I go back and look at how I looked at being an elder, I identified five, five roles that we have as elders. The first is we're an elder to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of things that I, I focus on. One is, how does our brain work now? <laughs> this is pretty simple. Um, I also talk about movement. All we need to do, they're all telling us, we just need to move more. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go out and run a mile or walk a mile unless today we walk a mile, tomorrow maybe it's a mile and a half. Mm -hmm. Just move more. The second role we have is we are an elder to the family, and that's all the members, starting with your own parents, all the way down to grandchildren and great-grandchildren. You're an elder to the community, and the community is, where do you live? What are you involved with? A lot of people now have two communities, because they live here in the summer, and they go someplace for the winter. You're also an elder to the, to the world. And this is looking at what we can do as from the planet, mm -hmm. but also what we can do to start understanding other cultures. This is probably one of the things that I, I feel so strongly about, because I've lived there. Um, I know that a lot of people that 
our Americans believe everybody wants to become an American. I'm saying they don't. <laughs> they love their own countries. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But they respect us for what we for our way of life. I don't see enough respect shown the other way at times. Okay. And then the last choice, and I say these are all choices you have, and there's different ways you can carry them out. But the last choice is if you choose to be a spiritual elder or not. Doesn't make any difference. That's your choice. That's your choice. My goodness sakes, you covered everything with those choices. Just everything that, in, you know, tells the whole story of the, your life. You know, with, um, I have, uh, five children and ten grandchildren and okay. six great grandchildren. They keep, are, keep me happy and broke. <laughs> but it seems like they are so different. And especially the little ones. Um, I walked in the door for a birthday party last Sunday and <clears throat> the littlest one was going to be one years old and she spotted me. Now I don't know her that well. She walked up to me with her arms up. That made uh, my day. Yeah. I was felt I was respect. She was respecting me. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, it was the biggest thrill. So things like that are working with your children and working and getting getting the stuff you should be. Um, I, Grandma, can you tell me what you did when so and so and so and so? Oh boy, I'm the first one in line. I and, enjoy it. Yeah, and I think that getting back also to what you were saying, mm -hmm. asking earlier about how do we keep our histories going. Mm -hmm. And you know, we used to always use oral history. That was the only way we learned about families. Mm -hmm. And now we don't have that. And I heard somebody the other day say, when we, have, <clears throat> when we used oral histories, we got the perspective of a number of people. Mm -hmm. When we only write it, we only get the perspective of one oh, person. So telling some of those oral perspectives, mm -hmm. I think, is really important. I know when my brother and my sister and I get together and go back to our memories, my brother and I say, her, her memories are creative. They're not like ours at all. <laughs> you know, great. I'd like to share that. I was at a, a large political event recently here in St. Paul. And it was interesting to me that a lot of people were our generation, which are 60s, um, and a lot of young people. And it was interesting the parallels between the young and our generation. Mm -hmm. uh, the idealism, the want, desire for change, the desire for good. And I, I think what we're really talking about is a spiritual approach to life. And that is all of us, uh, tribalism is a major concern. It's on the rise. And we're really all one and we all need to work together, and we all have something to give. The young have a technological background. It's like I had to send my smartphone back because it was too smart. I just said, I just want to make phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but they also, sometimes they don't have quite the people skills that we were no. raised with. And they don't necessarily have the sense of history, which we can give them. Getting to your statement, I don't know if any of you see, have seen this. Dr. Gary Small wrote this book, Eye Brain. And he gave me two words that I really like. He talked about those people that are certainly in their 20s, 30s, and lower. They are called digital natives. Yeah. We're digital immigrants. We are learning a new language. And you know, if you think about that, it really makes sense because these younger people, they're just wired that way. Mm -hmm. They yeah. just, it's just natural form. And here we struggle trying to learn this new language. So I really liked those words. Mm -hmm. We can learn so much from them. And we're going to change gears here for a moment. And thank you so much for all that you've contributed here today. This Thanks. is a subject we could go on a lot longer. But we have a surprise question that I have in my hands. I have not seen what's in this envelope, nor have you, mm -hmm. but I'm going to open it up. And uh, uh, Karen, please join us in the discussion, and we'll see what it is that our producer has asked us to talk about here today. Here's the question. Who or what are your favorites, and why? 
Oh, that is open-ended, wow. is it not? Completely. Who and what are your favorites and why? I don't have any real big f favorites, but what I do have is certain ones are very special. But I, all our grandchildren and our, all our family, we're very different people, but then again, we're not. So it would be family. Family. And mm -hmm. who and what are your favorites and why? And it doesn't necessarily mean, well, it did say who and what. Well, actually, I, I never had children. So my animal family, I have two dogs, a cat, and two parakeets. And um, you brought up an interesting point of, of in the mornings when you get up. My favorite thing in life is getting up in the morning and reading, being. We're human mm -hmm. beings, <laughs> to be. And suddenly you're literally one with everything. One of the things about getting older is less becomes more. That's also an acting term. <laughs> is, you know, we have a tendency as Americans to be crazy with activity. Mm -hmm. And just being quiet, reading, um, reflecting, journaling, uh, we're writers, um, and um, being quiet. And before the day starts, is just a beautiful, beautiful spiritual way to start the day. One of my favorites are the people I get to work with when I do consulting. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked a lot with factory people, people that are struggling um, to keep a job or get a job, um, mm -hmm. and yet have so much potential. And I really enjoy working with that group of people because I'm a pretty positive person, and mm -hmm. I, I think I inspire people Mm -hmm. to go beyond and I can, but I'm also about performance. So it makes a good uh, combination. Oh, I think so. And I'd have to say uh, my grandkids have been favorites. How could they not? <laughs> and more recently, some new great grandkids. Mm -hmm. And if I had to say why, it has a lot to do with that innocence, the spontaneity, mm -hmm. And the creativity that, that comes out of them. I have such a love for creativity, mm -hmm. whether that be artistic, mm -hmm. uh, technologically. Oh, yeah, I expect I'll be able to learn a few things <laughs> in that realm from them, too. Definitely. <laughs> I'd like to also act, I, uh, I mean, as an acting teacher, I get to work with all ages. It's absolutely remarkable what a child can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like I'm watching Mozart the how present they are they're like little human beings yeah. and and the variation and the talent levels are just astonishing do you think they miss anything though what do you mean the way the children are now and everything is always in such a big hurry do you think they're missing things like i don't know if they're missing i think that we grew up in a simpler time okay. uh, I, but i think that part of their evolution which is what technology is all about right is when you look at the advent of the car, the TV set, you know, <laughs> all of these things, now the computer, the cell phone that can do everything, mm -hmm. and you can kick it with you. Back in the old days, if your car broke down out in the country, you were screwed, uh -huh. you know, but now you just take out your phone. <laughs> Mom, come and get me, you know? And, and um, um, they seem to be um, more adept at dealing with the pressures and the activity levels. Probably because they grew up with it. They're growing that, up with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, right. it is an option for them. Yeah. It's just part of, you know, the the values mm -hmm. and also the life of the fact that many of them, both their mother and their father, work. Where mm -hmm. when I grew up, my yes. mother didn't work until no. I went to college. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. it was uh, it was a different time. I do think w one of the things I see though is that the the scheduling and the the running it is constant mm -hmm. and you were talking about simple one of the things i'm i looked at in the book was how can we as elders simplify our life mm -hmm. because we've also gotten on the treadmill mm -hmm. with all this mm -hmm. going yes, going yeah. going mm -hmm. and it does take time i mean i think i agree with you that silence that meditative, reflective, yeah. contemplative state is the one that keeps an elder going longer. Yes. 
balanced. Mm -hmm. It's the balance. Yeah. So that's, yeah, the balance um, is critical to people. I think also with young, what we're looking at is more mental, emotional illness. Mm -hmm. uh, addictions yes. are just mm -hmm. off the chart. Right. Uh, health issues, you know, diabetes. When we were young, weight was, most people did not have weight wasn't problems. wasn't an issue. And we didn't, we hardly had any diabetes or any of these issues. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a whole new set of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's always the disease issues and cancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge part for our generation. <laughs> wow. Who died this week that you know? <laughs> um, so uh, I think every generation has something and the generations historically have, have worked together in the greatest generation, our, our parents' generation, World War II, you know, are all leaving at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's sad to see that happen. It's part of the process and part of life. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys have been so fantastic, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm the <laughs> token. <laughs> we had to have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your contributions and working with this con conversation. This has been fun, and I've learned an awful lot. And I intend to work hard at being an elder and a treasure in my family. And mm -hmm. thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time on Generations. Before concluding today's episode, we'd like to debut a new feature on the show we're calling one Minute Observations with Diane Winkler. Diane is a remarkable person who has been a host of Generations since 2013. She remains active with both family and community life. Once a child announcer on the Lawrence Welk Show, today she is especially fond of visiting with school children and telling them about the annual St. Paul Winter Carnival. And now, a One Minute Observation with Diane Winkler. I have a question. Is there a law or rule that a child is allowed to be put on a witness stand and asked to say the things she saw and she heard regarding her father, who she was desperately afraid of, and as her mother was getting a divorce? I did not know why I did not know any reason and what is a divorce? I didn't know. That was not the kind of a stage that I wanted and I hoped for some day. But I did not ever tell any person about what had happened. The next seven or eight years, because I was about 10, years old when this happened. The following I knew I caused the divorce. I lived with this nightmare. When I realized it was not my fault, I do not remember even when.